Hello, welcome to another Revelation Minute. This is our third one. Uh, let me read the first three verses here of chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. The book of Revelation is the only book that promises a special blessing uh, to those who read it and keep the things which are written in it. That is, they obey its message. The blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near, verse 3. Philippians 4, 5 also says the Lord is near. When it says near like this, it's a statement of imminency. They believed in the early church, as well as we do today, that the Lord Jesus Christ could come at any time. That's what that word imminency means. His coming is near. It is imminent. The imminent personal coming of Christ brings a spiritual stability uh, to our lives. In the midst of all of the chaos and upheaval and unrest in this world, we know that Jesus could come at any time, at any moment. This is the application that brings the blessing that is talked about in verse 3. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the immediate context there, he had been talking about the Lord's coming. We should be eagerly waiting for the return of the Savior. He's going to come and he's going to make this humble body like his glorious one. Verse 21 continues, Who will transform our body of humiliation so that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working of his power, even to subdue all things to himself? So the Philippians were living in the hope of the return of Jesus. The Christians would greet one another. They had a special word. They would greet one another in the marketplace and they would say, Maranatha, which means our Lord come. So it was an Aramaic word and, and the Greeks didn't know it. So when the Christians used this, this secret word, this special word in the marketplace and greet each other that way, it was just a beautiful thing for them to hear and to express their anticipation in waiting for the Lord's return. The word on their lips that they would greet one another was Maranatha, our Lord come. In 1 John chapter 2, uh, verses 28 through 33, it says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Arthur, uh, author Doug Mendenhall wrote a parable about uh, this idea of being ready uh, when Jesus comes. He said, Jesus called me the other day to say he was passing through and wondered if he could stop by and spend a day or two with us. I said, sure, love to see you, Lord. When will you hit town? I said, sure, because I mean, it's Jesus, you know, and it's not every day you get the chance to visit with him. It's not like your in-laws and you have to stop and decide whether the advantage of their visit outweigh your having to move to the sleeper sofa. That's when Jesus told me he was nearby, at the convenience store out by the interstate. I must have gotten that Bambi in the headlights look, because my wife hissed, what is it? What's wrong? Who is that? So I covered the receiver and told her Jesus was going to arrive in eight minutes. 
and she ran out of the room and started giving guidance to the kids in that effective way that marine drill instructors give guidance to recruits. My mind was already racing with what needed to be done in the next eight, no, seven minutes now, so Jesus wouldn't think we were reprobate loser slobs. I turned off the TV in the den, which was blaring some weird, scary movie I'd been half watching. But I could still hear screams from our bedroom, so I turned off the reality show it was turned to. Plus, I turned off the kids set out on the sun porch because I didn't want to have to explain John and 8 plus Kate reruns to Jesus either six minutes from now. My wife had already thinned out the magazines that had been accumulating on the coffee table. She put Christianity Today on top for a good first impression. Five minutes to go. I looked out the front window, but the yard actually looked great thanks to my long, hard work, so I let it go. What could I improve in four minutes anyway? I did notice the mail had come, so I ran out to grab it. Mostly it was Netflix envelopes and a bunch of catalogs tied into recent purchases, so I stuffed it all back in the box, thinking Jesus didn't need to get the wrong idea three minutes from now about how much online shopping we do. I ran back in and picked up a bunch of shoes left by the door and tried to stuff them in the front closet, but it was overflowing with heavy coats and work coats and snow coats and pretty coats and rain coats and extra coats. We live in the South. Why we buy so many coats? I squeezed the shoes in with two minutes to go. I pumped up sofa pillows. My wife tossed dishes into the sink. I scolded the kids and she shooed the dog. With one minute left, I realized something important. Getting ready for a visit from Jesus is not an eight-minute job. Then the doorbell rang. A sudden visit by Jesus would lead us all to do some last-minute hurry and hurry cleaning up. Of course, this will never happen because whereas the Bible tells us that Jesus is going to pay each of us an unexpected visit, we won't have eight minutes to get ready. We won't even have eight seconds to try and get our thoughts in order. Though the Bible says that Jesus will return, and he will return in an instant. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says that his appearing will happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That word, Greek word for moment is atmos, from which we get our word atom. It is an indivisible moment of time, quicker than the batting of an eye. It's the length of the time it takes for light to flash. So there won't be time to clean up, straighten up our lives. No, Jesus' return will be too sudden for that kind of thing. Does it really matter when Christ will come to take his bride with him? Should the timing of the rapture make any practical difference in the life of a Christian? Or is it the issue so insignificant that Christians shouldn't bother with it? The timing of the rapture is a very practical matter because only the pre-trib teaches that Christ could come back at any moment. All of the other rapture views, which we will look at in more detail later, require people to go through at least part of the tribulation and have that unfold before Christ can return to rapture his bride. The at-any-moment possibility of Christ coming for us to be with him as he takes us to heaven, should provide a sense of urgency in our service and make a difference in our values, actions, priorities, and goals. Believing that Jesus could come at any moment, at any time, should fill us with hope and expectancy and exert a purifying influence on our lives. The passage in 1 John teaches us this. John is anticipating the imminent any moment return of Jesus, and he said it would affect the way Christians live. The fact that Jesus will return is written in the Bible over and over and over and over. I could just keep on going, and that's not an exaggeration, because the coming of Jesus that is mentioned 1,845 times in the Old Testament and 318 times in the New Testament you add that together, it's 2,163 times. Let me put it this way. For every verse in the Bible that talks about the first coming of Jesus, there are eight verses 
that talk about his second coming. The last days are upon us. That's quite a quote. Let's continue that quote. It says, Wait carefully the times. Look for him who is above all time, eternal and invisible. That statement was not made by a modern day prophecy expert. It didn't come from one of today's religious TV channels. It was made by a first century Christian by the name of Ignatius who lived in 110 AD, just a few decades after 1 John was written. Ignatius was a disciple of Polycarp, and Polycarp was a direct disciple of John the Apostle. Now, while we are not trying uh, to try and predict when Jesus will come, we are to be eager for that day to arrive. And I, for one, am eager. I hope you're ready if the Lord would, be, would come today. If you are not, why don't you take this next moment and make sure. God bless you. Have a great day.